order, Senator, Senator Wong. Unemployed. You will be in continuation. Questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister tell the Senate who was the Social Services Minister in 2016 when the robo-debt scheme was first introduced? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, I don't have the precise dates of various ministerial arrangements committed to memory. However, however, I am willing to uh, to assume, particularly given I assume this is meant to be a clever setup of the next question, uh, that Mr. Morrison would have been the minister at the time. Senator Wong, a supplementary oh, question. Most definitely was. And can the minister advise who was the treasurer? that bragged that robo-debt was proof of the social welfare system being, quote, better managed, end quote. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, once again, uh, um, uh, Mr President, unsurprisingly, I don't have the quotations of every single individual committed to, mo to memory, but I am again willing to assume, in terms of clever Labor Party tactics, uh, that Senator Wong already knows the answer uh, to that. Uh, that Senator Wong is, uh, is assuming the answer is Mr Morrison, that Senator Wong is assuming that the quest answer to the question is Mr Morrison. In fact, she already knows that that is probably the answer uh, to the question. Now, Senator Wong and everybody I would expect in this place would believe that debts ought to be recovered. Uh, now, obviously, there have been issues in relation to this matter. There have been issues in relation to this matter. The government has worked through those issues, including repayments in relation to it. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise who was the Prime Minister in 2020 when $1.2 billion was used to settle the claims of victims of this government's illegal robo-debt scheme? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, as I just said, repayments have been made in relation to this program. A process has gone through. Repayments have been made. In no way should that take away from the fact that where, where claims are made order and repayments ought to be recovered, then governments ought to find ways to undertake and recover those funds. That's an important principle order. that ought not be lost, notwithstanding the challenges in relation to this program and the fact order that those repayments have had to be made. Order, order, order. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Order. Will the minister, order, Senator Keneally. Senator will Brockman. the minister provide a response to the Senate on the Twitter post issued today by the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Brockman for his question. Uh, senators will have seen that the uh, Prime Minister has uh, this afternoon made a public statement in relation to uh, this social media post by the Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing. Let me be clear that the Australian Government has uh, called in the Chinese Ambassador and sought an apology from the Ambassador in relation to this tweet. It is an appalling, disgusting and outrageous piece of social media. It is a tweet which illustrates uh, the absolute scourge of disinformation and misinformation at, in social media, and it cannot be justified on any basis. As well as the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade conveying that message to the Ambassador here, we will be conveying that message directly in Beijing through our ambassador. We have also asked Twitter to remove the tweet yeah. as an yeah. example of disinformation. I echo the Prime Minister's expression of pride in all Australians who serve in uniform and who have served in uniform. Yeah. They do not deserve to be treated in this manner. It is the most egregious example of this sort of harmful conduct that I have seen in my time in the parliament, in my time in a ministerial portfolio uh, and, in fact, in anybody's uh, uh, viewing of social media in any context, Mr President. We have very clearly rejected uh, the premise upon which the tweet uh, or disinformation in this tweet is based. This government 
has invited the review of the Inspector General of the ADF. We are dealing with these issues openly, transparently and in a way in which you would expect in a liberal democracy like Australia. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Will the minister explain why this tweet constitutes disinformation? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Brockman. The Australian government does not resile at all from our responsibilities and our obligations regarding our involvement in Afghanistan. It is not that another country is commenting on our conduct in Afghanistan. Australia is a robust liberal democracy, more than capable of dealing with commentary of that nature. We are accountable for our actions, and that is why we called for and held the inquiry at the highest levels. We are taking unprecedented and difficult steps to hold those responsible to account, a small minority of Australian Defence Force personnel that are the subject of these serious, credible reports. Our response has been welcomed by the government of Afghanistan from the president to his ministry and others within the Afghan system. This image, however, is an absolute affront to common decency and to our entire defence force. It is grossly offensive and it should be removed. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Will the minister update the Senate on how Australia is working with international partners to combat disinformation? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. And the relationship amongst responsible international partners uh, around the world to combat disinformation, particularly during the period of the COVID-19 pandemic, is a very important one. Just this week, we will be sponsoring, co-sponsoring an event at the United Nations in New York on misinformation, which partners such as Latvia. Latvia led a joint statement in June, which we signed with 131 other countries, which warned that COVID-19 had, and I quote, created conditions that enabled the spread of disinformation, fake news and doctored videos, and in this case I would say photographs, to foment violence, to divide communities. We committed in that statement to fighting the so-called infodemic. I can assure you, Mr President and others in this chamber, that Australia will resist and counter efforts of disinformation. We will do so through facts and transparency underpinned by liberal democratic values that we will continue to promote at home and abroad. Yeah. Senator Wong. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted? Leave I, th granted. I thank the Senate and in the circumstance thought it would be useful to express support for the comments made by Senator Payne. Can I make clear on behalf of the opposition we condemn the action uh, taken by the Chinese government in the strongest terms. It is gratuitous, it is inflammatory and it is deeply offensive. And we say this is not the action, these are, this is not the behaviour of a responsible, mature international power. These tactics will be met with unified condemnation in the Australian community, and they will be judged harshly by the international community. The men and women of the Australian Defence Force serve with honour. They deserve our respect, the respect of our allies, friends and partners around the world. The allegations in the Brereton report have horrified Australia. What sets us apart is the dignified, transparent and accountable manner of our response. And that is what happens within the Australian democracy. I thank the Senator. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. In 2015, then Social Services Minister Scott Morrison targeted vulnerable Australians through his illegal robo-debt scheme in an attempt to achieve $4.7 billion in savings to bolster the, bottom, uh, the budget bottom line. Why? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Gallagher for her question. Um, clearly, um, the decision of many governments previous um, to make sure that Australians, make sure that Australians um, who have received money Order. from the taxpayer Order. for which that they were not entitled, there is an expectation by the Australian public that the governments will seek to recover Order. that debt. Um, and one of the measures which was put in place um, by the previous government and, and subsequently um, was, was, was undertaken um, by the government of which I am now a member Senator was to Watt. use a form of, uh, of uh, determination called income averaging. 
We subsequently know, we subsequently know and acknowledge that that me method by which we determined debts was deemed not to be valid. Senator and Keneally, we acknowledge that it was not it was determined not to Senator be valid. Keneally, and, and I believe Senator that the Prime Minister has actually apologised to those people who Senator have been impacted by that form of uh, of uh, uh, debt collection. However, as soon as we became aware that that method Order. of debt collection was not valid, we immediately Order. ceased collecting funds by that Senator means and put in place a very, very quick Senator uh, Neil, responsive program you to order by on which numerous we would occasions. pay back Australians who had received debt notices as a result of using income averaging as the means by which to determine that debt. So um, to stand Order. before you today, I mean we are not the only government to have used Senator income Neil, averaging as a means Senator to Keneally. which to, to determine debt. Um, and in fact, um, I mean I, I can actually Order. give you a number of quotes of uh, of people that still remain in this parliament that are members of your party who have made comments in relation to it. Um, you know, it's an example. In fact, I might wait to give the examples for the next question, so I've got more time. Order. Before I call you, Senator Gallagher, I'm going to insist that when I call a senator to order, they at least count to ten before they completely disobey the standing orders again. It's the first day of the last fortnight. It's going to be a very long one if people continue to behave like this, and it's going to make it hard for me to rule on points of order when I can't hear an answer. So I ask for a little bit of self-restraint on this first day. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The government was warned 76 times over a number of years by the AAT that its robo-debt notices were not legally enforceable. Why did Mr Morrison and the government ignore these warnings? Order. Senator Rustin. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, um, Senator Gallagher. Well, first of all, the government does value the role um, that the AAT does in providing independent merits reviews for a wide range of administrative traditions. But noting in each case that they are unique and they return on the absolute Order. facts of that case. Um, and there have been decisions Order. of the AAT that have upheld those decisions, and there have been decisions of the AAT that have not been upheld. And to suggest that every Senator single Arneel. case that goes before the AAT is the same as the last one fails to understand Order. the process that exists at the AAT. So I would draw to the attention to the senator who asked the question that, as I said in my answer to my previous question, as soon as this government became aware that using income averaging was not a valid means by which to collect a debt, Order, they Senator ceased Arneel. that program and immediately commenced a program of repaying that money to people who Order. had received. I'll call Senator Gallagher when I can hear her. Senator Gallagher, a final Thank supplementary you, question. Thank you, Mr President. Yes. As Social Services Minister, Treasurer and then Prime Minister, Mr Morrison has continued to persist with this illegal scheme. Why did he just ignore not only the warnings but the painful consequences for so many Australians? Senator Gallagher. Oh, sorry, sorry, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, um, I would put on the record that the Prime Minister has expressed um, his regret to those people that have been impacted by um, this particular um, activity, which, um, which we have acknowledged um, has been deemed as not being a valid means by which to, to collect debts. I mean, we don't want to shy away from the fact that it has been found that this is not a valid means by which to, to generate a debt. Um, you know, there is no argument, and we have apologised for the re and, and re shown regret for the consequences of doing that. But let us remind everybody in this chamber that this method of determining debts is not something that we came up with. In fact, it was under your watch. And I will, um, I will quote the then Minister for Human Services back in your government, Tanya Plebisek, uh, from the other place. You said, if people fail to come to an Order. arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. We support. Mr. Ms. Plebiscite's view on this 100 per cent. Order, Senator Rustin. Time has expired. Order on my left, Senator McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister outline for the Senate how the Morrison government's record economic support has kept Australians in jobs 
and connected to their employers, helping to drive our comeback and build a stronger Australia after the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for his question. Uh, Mr President, there is no doubt that the economy is still recovering from COVID-19, and as the Prime Minister has said, there is still a long road ahead. And in fact, when you look at some sectors, such as tourism and aviation, they are still facing significant challenges. Uh, but when you look at JobKeeper and the purpose of the JobKeeper payment, it has and continues to keep so many businesses in business and so many Australians in jobs. In fact, the RBA has said JobKeeper saved at least 700,000 jobs, and if it weren't for the JobKeeper payment, the unemployment rate in Australia would have been five percentage points higher. That's right, Mr. President, five percentage points higher. With the recovery now underway, what we're now seeing, though, is that fewer businesses are actually in need of JobKeeper. That said, of course, JobKeeper continues to support the sectors of the economy that do need Senator it the most. Mr. President, following a retest of business eligibility for the second phase of JobKeeper, for the two JobKeeper fortnights in October, around half a million entities have had applications processed covering more than 1.5 million employees or eligible business participants. The preliminary data indicates that around 450,000 fewer businesses and around 2 million fewer employees qualified for JobKeeper in October as opposed to September. These preliminary October JobKeeper figures suggest an improvement on the 2020-2021 budget assumption of 2.2 million recipients for the December quarter, with around 700,000 fewer employees or eligible business participants covered by the payment in October due to their employer no longer needing Order. the Senator payment. Cash. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In addition to the job-saving support of JobKeeper, how has the government's economic support measures assisted businesses with their cash flow, kept Australians in training and supported Australians with the cost of living? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Our number one priority as a government is, of course, to protect the health of Australians, to protect their jobs, and to protect their livelihoods. And we have put in place and delivered the policies that are supporting this. For example, in addition to the $70 billion JobKeeper payments to date, our supporting apprentices and uh, trainees' wage subsidy has now delivered over $723 million to keep over 103,000 apprentices and trainees in training. And that's where we need them, Mr President. We need them on the job, in training, and that's what we are doing. We also, as you know, though, have the cash flow boost. That has delivered over $32 billion to more than 800,000 employing small and medium businesses, giving them that vital cash flow when they need it at most. And of course, the SME Guarantee Scheme has delivered now more than 21,000 underwritten loans to small and medium businesses. We are putting in place the policies Order. to Senator keep businesses Cash. in business and Australians in expired. jobs. Senator McLaughlin, a supplement, final supplementary question. With encouraging signs that the virus has now been contained across Australia, how will the government's economic recovery plan support Australians back into jobs and businesses to invest and grow and deliver a new generation of economic success? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as you'd be aware, COVID-19 has been an economic and health crisis unprecedented in the last century. In Australia, we took early and comprehensive measures, of course, to stabilise our economy in the face of lockdowns and the enormous health uncertainty that we were faced with earlier this year. The JobKeeper program, which is actually Australia's largest wage subsidy program, has been critical to keeping so many Australians in jobs and building the foundation of what is now our economic recovery. Encouragingly, with the economic recovery now underway, we are seeing fewer businesses in need of JobKeeper. Over the last five months in October, with the uh, labour force figures coming out, we've now seen around 650,000 jobs return to the labour market. And this includes almost 344,000 jobs for women and around 226,600 jobs for young Australians. Senator Waters. 
Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, uh, representing the Prime Minister. A new raft of temperature records were broken over this weekend with an intense and prolonged heat wave in spring. The Bureau of Meteorology has previously advised that your 2030 targets have Australia on track for upwards of four degrees of warming. So even if you meet and beat your targets, Australia will experience heat waves growing in frequency and intensity every single year, destroying crops, killing more coral, shutting down workplaces and claiming lives. Will the government lift its 2030 target in order to meet what the science requires? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Waters for her question. Um, initially, let me just make the observation, which is always important in terms of considering climate policy, uh, that uh, a single week's or a single weekend's or a single weather event uh, shouldn't, of course, be conflated immediately as a matter of climate change. We're not dismissing at all the longer term trends and issues uh, that are reported and forecast by different agencies. In relation to emissions reduction in Australia, I think it is important to remember the relative success Australia has had in reducing our domestic emissions here in Australia when compared with other countries around the world. I, I hear Senator Order. Watts. I hear Senator Watts' comments. Australia's emissions are down 16.6 per cent since 2005. Down 16.6 per cent since 2005. Across comparable countries, across OECD nations, they've fallen by around 9 per cent. They've fallen by around 9 per cent. So we are running at nearly twice the rate of reduction compared with comparable countries. Indeed, other countries, allies and friends like Canada and New Zealand, who are often cited by the Greens or others on these matters, have barely shifted the dial in relation to their emissions, whilst Australia has seen a reduction of some 16.6 per cent. So Australia has delivered, is delivering and will continue to deliver when it comes to emissions reductions. Our country will beat our Kyoto-era targets by some 459 million tonnes in relation to abatement targets. That is a huge overachievement relative to the commitments we have made, and our ambition is well and truly not only to meet our Paris commitments, but to repeat our trajectory of meeting and beating as we did with Kyoto 1 and Kyoto 2. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Well, noting your reference to that 16.6 per cent figure, the quarterly emissions report released today shows that when you take out land use, which no other country uses in their figures, Australia's pollution is still higher than 2005 levels. The government's very proud of its figures today, but a pandemic is not a climate plan. Given gas is the main driver of pollution and risks our precious groundwater and farmland, will you dump your failed gas-led recovery? Senator Waters. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, gas plays a very important role in Australia's economy and in other economies in terms of enabling the transition from some fuels such as coal, which the Greens used to come in here and routinely talk about, to other fuels. Gas indeed has been a very important driver, not only in transitioning our economy and enabling stability and reliability in an energy system more reliant on renewable energy that comes with less reliability and needs to have dispatchable energy that can be scaled up when necessary, and gas plays a key role in that. But gas has increasingly played a role in relation to our other major trading partners being able to shift their emissions intensity in their economies as well. Gas plays a role in relation to Japan's emissions profile, to Korea's emissions profile. All of these key trading partners see gas as a crucial part of their own transition Order, Senator too. Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Eight out of every ten major businesses in Australia have today said that your 2030 target is inadequate and needs to be lifted. These are your people. Will the government attend President-elect Biden's promised climate summit to be held within 100 days of his swearing in and lift Australia's ambition, or will you push those businesses to instead invest outside Australia? Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Well, we might wait for invitations before we decide what we're going to attend or not uh, in relation to, uh, to President-elect Biden. But, uh, but we do very much welcome the fact that the President-elect uh, has indicated uh, a strong commitment to invest in technology that fuels and powers change in relation to climate change. The President-elect's commitment in relation uh, to technology investment is consistent with our own commitment with our own commitment of a $1.9 billion technology investment package in low emissions technologies. We see enormous complementarities between what President-elect Biden and our government are seeking to pursue in relation to how you achieve transformation in emissions, how you get improved outcomes in that regard. These are the crucial things that we will work and cooperate uh, with the Biden administration on. Uh, and indeed, we look forward to that engagement, particularly the complementarity with our largest investment partner and the ability in pursuing those Order, technologies Senator to Birmingham, cooperate for the at a private level as well expired. as a government. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. There are nearly 1 million Australians unemployed, 1.4 million underemployed, and 2.8 million relying on government support and unemployment is on the rise. How many of the 25,000 Australians who recently joined the unemployment queues were forced there because of the Morrison government's withdrawal of support? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr President, our government through this crisis period of the pandemic has sought to respond not only to the health crisis and to achieve what are global leading results in terms of protecting Australians uh, from the health risks of COVID-19, but we have also responded in unprecedented ways in terms of support for the Australian economy. And just as, just as the health results are amongst the best in the world in terms of the resilience that Australia has shown, so too are our economic results amongst the best in the world. That is not to say that there aren't Australians doing it very tough. There clearly are. And today we note the announcement by Qantas in relation to job losses that will be sustained at Qantas and changes that company is making to try to ensure its resilience into the future. Now, I, I hear the interjections from those opposite, Mr President, who seem to pretend that in a world where global aviation has been battered to its core, there is some easy solution in relation to, to these matters. There's not, Mr President. You can't live in the fantasy world of those opposite. The reality is that we have put in place, through the JobKeeper mechanism, the single largest intervention in the Australian economy by a government in our peacetime history ever. And in doing so, we have helped sustain and save many thousands of jobs. We've helped sustain and save many thousands of businesses. But we said at the outset it was never going to be possible to save every single business or every single job, given the nature of the crisis that we face. But we are continuing Order. to invest, having created JobKeeper, extended JobKeeper and, of course, now pursuing through our budget a range of policy measures designed to drive jobs growth in the economy, to help with the recovery and to Order. get people Senator back to Birmingham. work as quickly Time as possible. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you. Last week, the Deputy Governor of the RBA warned the government to, and I quote, be careful of removing the stimulus too early. What is the economic impact of the Morrison government's decision to withdraw JobSeeker and JobKeeper in March? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we outlined at the beginning of the pandemic and our economic response that what we sought to apply were measures that were temporary, were targeted and were proportionate. There have been the principles that have guided the government's response through this crisis, with some $507 billion in financial support uh, for the Australian economy, representing some 25.6 per cent of GDP. That record level of support has provided a lifeline to so many individuals. But in terms of the temporary, targeted, proportionate nature, we have also been taking careful steps and decisions in relation to JobKeeper. Those careful steps and decisions have seen, and JobKeeper, those careful steps and decisions have seen JobKeeper go through a number of steps and iterations, 
that do see eligibility. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. <clears throat> In the eight seconds the minister has left, I wonder if he could be directly relevant to the question, which was the economic impact of a decision to withdraw JobKeeper and JobSeeker in March. We've had a lot of process, a lot of rhetoric, but there was a question which Australians are deeply interested in. Um, that question, Senator Wong, I've allowed you to remind the Minister of the question which followed a quotation regarding stimulus broadly from the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank. My notes reflect. I'm listening carefully to the Minister, but in my view, if he is talking about that policy, you can debate the answer after question time, but he is being directly relevant to the question because of the use of that quotation. Senator Birmingham. And Mr President, as we've said at every step of this crisis, we will continue to monitor the impacts at each step of the decision making and we will make decisions accordingly. That's why we created Order. JobKeeper. It's Senator why we Birmingham, extended time it. for the answers expired. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In addition to the Reserve Bank, the OECD has also warned the Morrison government to avoid withdrawing vital support from the economy too early. How many Australians will lose their jobs as a result of the Morrison government ignoring these warnings? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we have seen in the last five months some 650,000 jobs across the Australian economy recreated. This has, been, this has been a result uh, of the type of measures that our government's put in place to give the economic stability and lifeline that Australia needed. The senator referenced the OECD and their different analysis in her question. Well, Mr President, if you want to look at the global comparisons, you see that economic growth in Australia did indeed in the June quarter contract by 7 per cent. However, if you look across comparable nations, we saw that in Germany it contracted by closer to 10 per cent, in Canada by closer to 11.5 per cent, by the US by more than 9 per cent, and by the UK by more than 20 per cent. Uh, and I hear Senator Gallagher say, well, that's comforting for the Australians who have lost their jobs. As I said in the primary question, we acknowledge this is difficult for many people, but this is a global pandemic we are responding to, Order. and our Senator government Birmingham, is applying unprecedented support to get Australians through it. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is for Minister for Finance, Trade, Tourism and Investment, Minister Birmingham. Australia has no market other than China for 30 per cent of Australia's exports and no alternative source for 20 per cent of Australia's imports. We have put too many eggs in the bar China basket with 40 per cent of all export dollars earned in China and now we are subject to import bans on a range of Australian commodities including Australian coal, barley, wine and lobsters. These restrictions are designed to hurt our economy until we make change to a raft of policies according to documents leaked by the Chinese Embassy in Canberra to news outlets. Australian businesses are suffering. When will the government admit its mistake and change course? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson for her question. These are very difficult times for many Australian businesses uh, who have uh, trade relations with China, uh, and the Australian government has expressed uh, deep concern at the fact that China, through a series of actions, uh, particularly through the course of this year, but some of them dating back uh, over a couple of years, has taken adverse action against Australia and Australian exporters. We absolutely oppose the actions that China has taken. We have sought very clearly uh, to engage China both in terms of the detail of the actions they've taken, but also to urge them to the table. As indeed the Prime Minister, Senator Payne, and with bipartisan support, Senator Wong, have indicated today, uh, we are also grievously offended by the actions of the Chinese Foreign Ministry in relation to the image and words they have posted on Twitter today. But our government has not just fostered open trading relations with China. We have equally fostered them uh, through a range of agreements struck with Japan, with the Republic of Korea, with Canada, with Mexico, with Peru, with Vietnam, with Indonesia. We have opened the door for trading relations for Australian businesses right around the world, and we pursue similar trade agreements with the European Union, the United Kingdom, and deeper trade relations with India and a range of other countries and markets. 
Ours is a market economy in which Australian businesses and companies make decisions about with whom they trade and where they trade, where they sell their goods to and from whom they buy what they choose to do. And under those, uh, under those agreements and under the terms of our economy, we encourage businesses to get out there because what it's achieved is 33 consecutive months where Australia has exported more than we've imported as a nation. That's good news for Order. Australia. It's Senator been good Birmingham, news for businesses. Time for the answer and we want that has continue. expired. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you. This morning, Minister, you refused to acknowledge that China was engaged in economic coercion against the people of Australia. Was this because you are afraid to stand up and tell the people of Australia the truth, or are you afraid of standing up to China? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I think you have heard in this chamber today, from the words indeed of Senator Payne, uh, Senator Wong, myself, the Prime Minister earlier today, most importantly, uh, that the government is well and truly happy to stand up to China in those, uh, in those terms. Uh, and I have, for a long period of time, been expressing our concerns, firstly, about the individual actions that China has been taking, and more recently, about the cumulative effect of those actions. But it is important to note, Mr President, the statistic, as I said before, that month after month after month, Australian exporters and Australian businesses have been getting out to the world and selling more to the world and exporting more to the world than we have been importing. And they've been doing that under the network of trade agreements that our government and indeed previous governments have <coughs> negotiated. It is important, Mr President, that our businesses are able to continue to do that because one in five Australian jobs depends on trade, and we want to help support those jobs to continue to grow Order, in the Senator future Birmingham, across a range time of markets. The answer expired. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Thank you. China is boycotting our product, with 80 ships line off their shores with coal, full of coal. One Nation, many Australians believe that Chinese products should be boycotted over the Christmas period. Will the government lend their support to the boycott push, or keep letting Australia push Australia around? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I think there are a range of implications that China faces from a number of its actions that it's been taking of late. The fact that China has created such a higher risk environment for businesses trading and working with them doesn't just reflect poorly on China in the eyes of Australians. It is a point being noted around the world and indeed China's actions around the world, not just towards Australia but towards other nations in terms of trade sanctions and other sanctions are being noted and reflecting poorly upon China. And that reflection will be seen in the eyes of both governments here and around the world, and no doubt, Senator Hanson, in the eyes of consumers who will make their choices about the products that they buy and the countries that they buy them from. Consumers, no doubt, will be mindful of the types of actions we've seen today in terms of those terrible, appalling, shocking images and that, I'm sure, will reverberate in their minds as they make those purchasing decisions. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the government is building a more secure Australia and preserving our regionally superior Collins-class submarine capability? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. Uh, and also for his support for our Defence Forces in Western Australia and for welcoming HMS Arunta home. Thank you. Australia rem submarines remain one of the most important capabilities in our Defence Force. The Collins-class submarines are only halfway through their life, and they are now very, very capable. Capable of shaping, capable of deterring, and also capable of responding to Australia's complex and very rapidly changing strategic environment. To preserve our Collins-class submarine, the Morrison government is very carefully considering the management of our entire submarine fleet over the next 50 years. We are ensuring that the Collins-class continues to remain regionally superior and well served and in service well into the 2030s. And we will continue to ensure that they exceed international benchmarks again for decades to come. This is achieved through planned upgrades and technological uh, upgrades done both in Western Australia and South Australia, implemented during full cycle, mid cycle and intermediate cycle docking. With Australian industry, we will grow our submarine capability ahead of the attack class submarines transition uh, in the 2030s 
and out into the 2040s. Good management of this fleet has not always been the case. Never forget when we came into government in 2013, we inherited low submarine availability and Navy often struggled to get a single boat operational into, out to sea. There was no plan to upgrade and extend the life of our Collins-class submarines. No decision had been made on the future submarine sustainment and there was no naval shipbuilding and sustainment plan. But this government has turned the shipbuilding and sustainment industry into a truly national sovereign capability. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate what shipbuilding benefits uh, the coalition government has delivered to Western Australia since 2013? Senator Reynolds. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mr President. Under this government's plan, naval shipbuilding, naval shipbuilding has gone from zero to booming in seven years. We are committed to building 45 vessels at Henderson worth around $16 billion. Already, about $3 billion of contracts have been signed with WA shipbuilders. A $1.5 billion transformation of defence infrastructure at Henderson and at HMAS Stirling is well underway. And we are investing more than $300 million in new maritime tracking ranges off the coast of Perth. Hundreds, hundreds, in fact thousands, of new multi-generational jobs are being created across these programs throughout the supply chain in Western Australia. And I can assure all West Australians that all shipbuilding and sustainment decisions will be made for the right reasons at the right time in the national interest, and all Australians would expect nothing less. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank the minister for that update. Good news for Western Australia. Can the minister advise the Senate what shipbuilding benefits the coalition government has delivered to South Australia since 2013? Senator Reynolds. Mm. Uh, thank you very much again, Mr President. Uh, under this government's plan, the coalition's government commitment to shipbuilding in South Australia has once and for all ended Labor's valley of death. Our record investment is building 23 of the world's most advanced naval platforms uh, at the new digital shipyards in Osborne. We have delivered the Hobart-class destroyers and have laid the foundations for continuous shipbuilding in Australia for many, many generations to come. This astonishing achievement in just seven short years has created thousands of jobs, created new business opportunities in South Australia and has helped reinvigorate Australia's industrial landscape. These are jobs that our great-grandchildren and the workers in South Australia, their great-great-grandchildren, will still be working in these industries in South Australia. The people of South Australia can have confidence that they are at the forefront of this government's plan to ensure Australia has Order. the maritime Senator Reynolds, capabilities time we for need. The answer has expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Former Minister for Finance Matthias Cormann has been jetting across Europe in a RAAF plane to the tune of $4,300 an hour to interview for his next job. What does the minister say to the nearly 37,000 Australians stranded overseas who are watching a former minister of the Morrison government fly around at taxpayer expense while they remain stranded overseas and are likely to miss Christmas with their families? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, let me firstly deal with returning Australians, and then I'll ret return to the issue of Mr. Cormann and the OECD. Mr. President, in relation to returning Australians, it is Order. well known, well known, that the prime constraint in relation to getting more people into Australia are the quarantine facilities Order. and their availability within Order. Australia. Our government. Our government, thanks, Senator our government thanks the states and territories for working with us in relation to increasing the numbers of quarantine places. Senator we Keneally. thank the fact that working with the states and territories we've been able to grow the number of returning Australians on a regular basis. And we welcome the fact that when Victoria is able to again 
increase or welcome returning Australians and house them in hotel quarantine, then we will be in a position to see a further growth from around 5,600 currently processed to around 5,700. This is Order about on my see, left. those opposite, Mr. President. Those opposite seem to somehow think Senator Walsh. They seem to somehow think that hotel quarantine Order. is an easy, safe thing, and that we can just pile more and more and more Order. and more and more in, and then there's no consequence to it. And there's no consequence to it. Well, I think the people of Victoria have seen there's a consequence to it. The people of South Australia have seen there's a consequence to it. So there are absolutely real issues when it comes to how we safely return Australians to Australia. Order In no way do we wash our hands left. of it, Senator Wong. On In no order. way do we wash our hands. We absolutely are working closely with Senator the states Wong. and territories. We've put ADF troops on the line Senator to work Wong. with them. We've grown the number of places. We're getting more Australians home. We are doing that as quickly as is possible while keeping Australia safe from COVID at the same time. I'm going to Senator Keneally. Senator Keneally, please resume your seat for a moment. On num Senator Wong, on numerous occasions there, I was calling senators to order. This will become a very miserable two weeks if people don't have some basic decency so that I may hear answers for inevitable points of order. You're quite right, Senator Wong. Um, Senator Birmingham does have a very strong voice. I still had trouble hearing him. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Mr. President, Mr. Morrison defended the $4,300 an hour on a private plane, saying, and I quote, if Matthias was flying around on a commercial plane, he would have gotten COVID. The risk of that was extremely high. Can the minister explain to the nearly 37,000 stranded Australians why Mr. Morrison believes it's acceptable for them to fly commercially at hugely inflated prices and face the extremely high risk of contracting COVID-19, but it's not okay for a former member of his government? Order. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, not only do those opposites seem to think that there's some magic solution to be able to increase the available of safe entry points Order. into Australia. Not only do they ignore the fact that there are charter Order. flights and supported commercial Senator arrangements Keneally. that our government has put in place, but they also bring the most small-minded little Australia attitude to our candidacy for the OECD. I mean, having come out and supported the candidacy initially, they now seem to want us to run a campaign in a half-baked way intended to somehow lose. Now, Australia having decided to field a candidate Order. for this position, to field a candidate for this position is intended to campaign in a way to win, Mr. President. That's what's important, to actually make sure that having put Australia out there to win, we get on and do so. And so, Mr. President, we are supporting this candidacy. We're doing so because it will help Australia in the long term to influence the Order, result. Senator Birmingham, time for the answers expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Last week, Stranded Australians appearing before the Senate COVID-19 Select Committee referred to the Morrison government's decision to fly Matthias Cormann in an RAAF plane as, and I quote, appalling and an old mates club. Are they wrong? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we have absolute sympathy for the plight of many Australians overseas. And it is, why, it is why we have worked to increase those quarantine places, put in place more supported flights and, indeed, provide targeted assistance in a range of different ways. But in relation to support for candidacies, we think this is a thing that Australian governments consistently should provide. Indeed, if we look back, I can see that Gareth Evans was provided with some $250,000 of support in 1999 dollar terms, $250,000 of support for his Order. candidacy, for his candidacy by the Order. Howard government Senator Birmingham, to I'm, UNESCO. Senator Birmingham, I've got Senator Keneally on a point of order. Senator Keneally, order uh, a is point relevance. of order. My point of order is relevance. In no time did I mention 1995 or Gareth Evans. There are 37,000 stranded Order, Australians Senator that Senator Keneally, have doubled, please resume and your seat. Hasn't... Resume your seat. Quite frankly, 
if you want to keep showing this amount of disrespect to the chair on the first day of the last fortnight, it's going to be a very slow question time as I constantly interrupt questions and answers. I do ask, while it is a very vibrant chamber, for people to at least heed me and pay a little bit of respect to the chair when I'm calling people to order. Now, on the point of order, Senator Keneally. Um, your question contained a number of pejorative phrases uh, in terms of quoting people. Um, when questions contain pejorative phrases, I'm listening carefully, but in comparison, for example, to the first question asked today, which was, which was very specific, there was no latitude for the minister to stray. But when questions contain politically loaded phrases, I don't think it's um, out of order for a minister to be able to um, respond in kind. That said, this was a quotation, not an assertion on your behalf. I accept that. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. He has 15 seconds remaining to address the question. Mr President, we absolutely are giving all the support we can to get returning Australians home safely, whilst not jeopardising the safety of people in Australia or our economy in terms of the number of places that are available to get people back Order, safely Senator and Birmingham, securely. Senator Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is ensuring survivors of institutional child sexual abuse are able to receive redress? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Askew, for that very important question. And it is particularly timely um, since the government, um, myself together with the, uh, the Assistant Minister, Sazelja, uh, announced on Friday that we would be introducing legislation uh, and regulatory reform to strip institutions who fail to under accept their responsibility to join the redress scheme of their charitable status. Uh, this was a commitment that the Prime Minister made earlier this year uh, to survivors, and it is one that we are absolutely determined that we will fulfil. So uh, once the, the legislation and the regulations have gone through this place, no charitable or religious organisation or institution will be able to benefit from taxation concessions while victims of, uh, and survivors of child sexual abuse continue to be denied the redress that they so rightly deserve. To date, 129 charities have been identified as being named in applications in the scheme who have not yet joined the scheme. Whilst I acknowledge that many of those organisations are currently in the process of onboarding, uh, we already know that there was one charitable organisation that was named in the July statement this year who has absolutely refused to accept their responsibility um, for the abuse that was, um, was uh, 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 undertaken. Uh, in their institution. The Prime Minister has been absolutely clear in his statement that anybody who is named in the Royal Commission or who has an application lodged against them must do everything in their power to join the redress scheme so that we are in a position to be able to provide the redress to survivors that they so justly deserve. And I'd like to take this opportunity to remind the 80 charitable institutions who currently are in the process of onboarding, who gave a commitment that they would onboard by the 31st of December 2020, uh, that they have until the 31st of December, and if they do not join in that time, they will be named and shamed, and full sanctions will be taken against them. Senator, ask you a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how do the changes assist the government in signing institutions up to the redress scheme? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Um, look, we know this is a particularly complex area, um, and I'm very pleased to be able to say that we've actually taken a two pronged approach to ensure that we are able to get access to survivors and make sure that no survivor is left behind. Firstly, we'll be amending the Charities and Not for Profit Commission regulatory framework to require all charities. To, have, uh, to participate in the scheme if a claim has made, been made against them or is likely to be made against them. Um, should that charity fail to take reasonable steps, that will mean that they do not meet their requirements and will be subject to the full suite of existing compliance powers, which includes deregistration as a charity. This would mean that they will no longer be able to get access to the favourable taxation concessions like income tax, fringe benefits tax and direct recipient status. It I hope will make those uh, charities think twice. 
And further, we will also be making sure that basic religious charities are put into the same bucket Order. as other charities. Senator Rustin. Senator Askew, a final supplementary question. Thank you. How does this important change add to other measures the government has implemented to ensure institutions do not shirk their moral obligations? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Well, we already have been able to make 4,200 payments, um, but we understand that more needs to be done, and that's why we are putting these very strong sanctions in place. Because if the, just the thought of being named and shamed isn't enough, then hopefully the financial penalty that this will do will make sure that people understand their responsibility and that this government is absolutely serious. Um, we have made it uh, absolutely clear that we expect any institution that was named in the Royal Commission uh, to join and any institution that has been named in an application from a survivor. We want them to join the scheme and we want to make sure that we have every power to compel them to do so. Um, we've also made it very clear that any institution who fails to join the scheme, who is receiving government funding, will no longer be eligible to be able to receive that funding. And I may remain absolutely committed to name and shame every single institution that does not accept their responsibility to survivors of child sexual abuse and give them the redress they deserve. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister confirm the government received 14 official reports of robo-debt victims threatening self-harm on 7 January 2017, 13 of July 2017, 1 August 2017, 8 of August 2017, 28 of August 2017, 30 of August 2017, 6 of October 2017, 23 of October 2017, 26 of October 2017, 6 of November 2017, 7 of August 2018, 24 of September 2018, 6 of November 2018, and 11 of December 2018. The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McCarthy for her question. Senator McCarthy, I do not have the information that you've required with me today. However, I will take the specific um, answers to the detailed uh, question that you asked in, uh, in relation to the, each and every one of those individual incidents of which you have just um, quoted. But um, I would also make the point that this is a very delicate and sensitive area. Um, and that we need to be mindful that we handle any issue when it comes to um, actions uh, that, and we need to, and I suppose I would warn everyone Order. opposite that um, this, talking about this particular issue Senator requires great sensitivity and I'd caution anyone to be making unfounded conclusions to continue to perpetuate the upset and trauma that is inflicted on the loved ones. Order. Senator, McCar order. Senator McCarthy is on her feet. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Has the minister asked the department for a report on how many Australians died by suicide as a result of the government's illegal robo-debt scheme? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, um, as I said, we need to be very careful and very sensitive, and anybody um, who uh, dies by suicide is, is a tragedy, and I, I want to say that up front. But, Senator McCarthy, I, I reject the premise of your question in saying that, because uh, I, I believe it is absolutely incorrect for you to interpret um, Centrelink comes, customer death statistics as, as suicides. These are all individual people, individual cases, and all deserve the respect to not just be spoken about as a statistic. We know, we know, Senator McCarthy, um, that um, Order. as of oh, Order. That, that there are a number of people um, who are deceased customers who esta whose estates are entitled uh, to a refund under the income compliance program. And those people will receive their refunds, as will everybody else in the income order. compliance Senator program. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Well, Mr. President, uh, the question was asked with the sensitivity that this minister is urging. And what Senator McCarthy asked, and I, the point of order is direct relevance, is whether a report, uh, whether the minister had sought a report uh, about those who might have died by suicide as a consequence of being pursued under the illegal scheme. So we haven't asked about refunds. We've asked whether or not there has been a report asked for 
around the effects of the scheme. On the point of order, I've allowed you to restate the question there, Senator Wong. Um, while the minister was talking about this sensitive matter in substance, I do consider her to be directly relevant. You've restated the question. She has four seconds remaining to answer, or have you concluded? Oh, Senator Rustin has concluded the answer. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Minister, why did the government persist with the Prime Minister's robo-debt scheme when it knew it was illegal and there were reports of self-harm and suicide? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, and, and as I said to uh, a previous question that was asked from me um, by those on the other side, um, that when it became, we became aware that the income compliance program, which used income averaging as the sole determining factor for determining a debt, we ceased that program. We ceased that program and we commenced immediately putting in place a program to repay those debts. Um, we have nearly completed that program um, and we are just working through the final stages to make sure that anybody who had debt was, uh, was raised as a result of income averaging is now in the process of receiving that refund. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator O'Neill. Very much, uh, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers given to, by Senators Birmingham and Rustin to the questions asked by Senators Wong, Gallagher and McCarthy. And uh, in a feat of contortionism I don't think I've quite ever witnessed in this place, Senator Birmingham was unable to answer any of the three questions asked by Senator Wong with the truth. So let's just get it on the record. Senator Wong did ask, can the minister tell the Senate who was the social service minister in 2016 when the robo-debt scheme was first introduced? And for those who want to know the truth, the answer is Mr Scott Morrison. The second question that was asked of uh, Senator Birmingham by uh, the leader of uh, the opposition here in the Senate, Senator Wong, was who was the treasurer in 2016 and bragged that robo-debt was proof of the social welfare system being better managed. And the answer to that question is Mr Scott Morrison. Finally, Senator Wong asked Mr. Mr. Uh, Minister Birmingham, can the minister advise who was the prime minister in 2020 when $1.2 billion was used to settle the claims of victims of the government's illegal robo-debt scheme? And again, the trifecta, the answer was Mr Scott Morrison. And Australians should never forget that the Prime Minister was the man who cooked up the robo-debt scheme. He was the Treasurer who bragged about using robo-debt to reduce Australia's debt, preying on very vulnerable people in the most egregious way. And he is the Prime Minister, right at this moment when the biggest payout for a failing of a government is making history. $1.2 billion was assigned by the courts to give compensation for people who were caught up in the scheme of Mr Morrison's design, of his implementation and now a very, very belated clean-up. I want to deal with the constant mistruth that we keep hearing from Senator Rustin with regard to this robo-debt scheme being a common practice and the absolute uh, untruth that she tells when she said that this was a practice established by the Labor Party. I want to make it very, very clear that the Labor Party did check to see if there was a signal of a mismatch between what was on the record in the Department of Social Services and in the ATO. And if there was a mismatch, the public servants then absolutely did the work to confirm the facts. The reality is there were 20,000 per year, 20,000 Australians per year, who were investigated using that scheme. 
But the minute Mr Morrison got his hands on it, let me tell you how many illegal debts were being delivered to Australian people per week. 20,000 Australian people served a debt from their own government, an illegally constructed debt. That lie that is constantly being told that it was once the same under a Labor government must end. It is nowhere near the truth. Mr Morrison is responsible for the construction of the robo-debt debacle. He is the Treasurer who banked the savings at the expense of the Australian people, and he is the Prime Minister who, is, who must be held responsible for the impact on the great Australian nation. Senator McCarthy asked Senator Rustin a very sensitive question. And Senator, McCarthy's, uh, Senator Rustin's response was to lower her voice and talk about suicide and self-harm as a sensitive and delicate matter. Well, it is indeed. It's a very sensitive matter, and it matters very much to people who've lost loved ones because they couldn't stand the pressure of the debt and the debt notices and the debt collectors that were sent upon them by their own government. And the government has continued to deny that people self-harmed and in desperation took their lives because of Mr Morrison, because he cooked up the scheme, because he delivered it as Treasurer and because he backed it in as Prime Minister on at least 76 occasions when the AAT knew that they were doing the wrong thing and told the government. This is a government that must hang its head Thank you, and the Australian should, Your people time should kick them expired. out on this. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, and thank you for this opportunity to contribute um, to this important issue. Uh, I think the, the, the conclusion there to Senator O'Neill's uh, speech uh, indicates the objectives of the other side here. Senator O'Neill was most passionate when she was uh, accusing the Prime Minister of certain ills, not, uh, not uh, when she was seeking to uh, uh, defend or pursue the interests of, of average Australians. Clearly, the objective here uh, of the opposition is not to help people, uh, but to hurt the Prime Minister. That is what they, the approach they have taken here. In fact, in her very first contribution, Senator O'Neill accused uh, the government and, and others, the Prime Minister and others, of being untruthful. Uh, and then uh, she herself went on to make clearly untruthful statements. Uh, uh, at the very time she was accusing others of being untruthful. She, she, Senator O'Neill mentioned that, um, uh, that, in her view, Mr Birmingham did not provide truthful responses to the answers given today, well, to the questions given today. Sorry, one of the um, questions that she claimed there was no response to was who was the Social Services Minister in 2016. Well, despite a simple Google search being able to provide the answer to that, uh, Minister Birmingham did mention uh, Mr Scott Morrison in answer to that question. I distinctly, despite the heckling from the other side, it was hard to often hear half of what uh, was being said uh, uh, by ministers this afternoon. Uh, I did distinctly hear uh, Minister Birmingham, the Leader of the Government of the Senate, say that, yes, Mr Morrison was the Social Services Minister in 2016. That was a very useful uh, part of question time this afternoon. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, the, unlike the opposition, the, the government's focus now is on, on helping those uh, uh, that have been put in this situation. The, the Prime Minister has apologised for the hurt and harm that uh, uh, has been caused uh, by the issues with this uh, program. And the focus now of the government is on ensuring that people receive the relief as soon as possible. Uh, uh, we know and been transparent about the fact that around 525,000 debts have been wholly or partially uh, raised using income averaging. The total amounts of the, the refunds being provided uh, because of these debts are uh, set at around $741 million. They, they involve or, or around 430,000 Australians will have their debts zeroed through this process. Um, uh, and approximately 378,000 of those uh, will receive a refund. The, the balance hadn't actually uh, made a repayment, so there'll be no direct refund, of course, but the debt will be wiped. <coughs> um, as of the 27th of November, 406, just over 406,000 people have had their refunds completed. 
a total of $707 million paid. So by, well not mentioned here in my notes, by my math that, sim that leaves around 23 uh, to 24,000 people uh, are still uh, to process their debts. But uh, the vast majority, about 95,000, oh, sorry, 95% of people and 95% of refunds by value have now been uh, processed. And that's going to continue to remain the, the, uh, the focus of the government, including through the, uh, the settlement that has been reached uh, in the class action with Gordon Legal. Uh, uh, and that should be the focus of any government, because uh, if the opposition were true uh, to their claims to, to care about the impacts of these issues on people, uh, uh, what we should be now is f focused on that relief, focused on providing uh, that uh, assistance to people in this circumstance. It is still very important, of course, that we continue to maintain the integrity of our welfare system. Uh, uh, the Australian government spends $180 billion a year uh, on welfare, and uh, support for such welfare programs uh, is reliant on making sure uh, that that money is spent on those who truly need it. Uh, there are, of course, those who do seek to defraud uh, the Commonwealth, uh, 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 and it is important that there are compliance activities uh, to stamp out such fraud, penalise such fraud when and do it does occur. And, and all governments uh, for decades have pursued uh, such anti-fraud programs, and I'm confident that all governments in the future, including if there is to be a Labor government in the future, will continue to do so because we support our welfare system, we support its integrity and we'll continue to operate in the best way we can. Thank you, Senator Canavan. I'm oh, Senator Billick, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President. So I speak today about the Minister's completely underwhelming response to the questions about robo-debt today. And we all know robo-debt's been an unparalleled disaster. It was illegal and it was executed atrociously. Hundreds of thousands of Australians had to go through unnecessary stress and heartache of disproving their liability for debts that they didn't even owe. And while governments have previously matched ATO data with Centrelink data, this government automated it and took, it, took out the human oversight element, um, moving from 20,000 cases a year to 20,000 cases a week. I'm a member of the Community Affairs References Committee and we've handed down the third interim report on the Centrelink's compliance program, or robo-debts, uh, as it's known. And we heard evidence and read submissions from witnesses who lives were completely devastated by this program. Now, let's remember the government's intent was to rip hundreds of millions of dollars out of the pockets of people that have been on extremely low income. They wanted to do everything they could to scrape together cash for their fantasy surplus, no matter how dubious the methods were. And instead, they've now been ordered to drop the debts, repay discredited debts which were already paid, and pay millions in compensation and legal fees, resulting in costing taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars in government legal and administrative costs. Robo-debt was illegal. It was against the law. There is no if, buts or maybe. It wasn't just legally insufficient, as a government official tried telling me in, in a hearing into robo-debt. It was plain illegal. And the government's explanations today just aren't good enough. People were treated as cheats and debtors by their government. In fact, 430,000 people were treated like this. 430,000 people um, who paid the government when they didn't owe them a cent. This is money that they usually use to pay for rent, electricity, food and other daily basic living expenses. And these people went through enormous stress and suffering. People died. People committed suicide. Lives were ruined by this program. And now, today, in question time, the government are warning us about speaking about it out of a sense of respect. Well, it's a shame they didn't have that same sense of respect when they were harassing people. And we all know whose brainchild robo debt was and then who the treasurer was who announced it and who the prime minister is who didn't stop the implementation of his own botched policy. Yep, Mr Morrison for all three positions. And that probably explains why we can't find out what the government knew and when they knew it. 
personally, I think there's a fair bit of protecting your own backside going on on that side of the chamber and maybe out of the Prime Minister's office. This should never have happened. It shouldn't have taken a class action on behalf of thousands of people to rectify the mistakes of this government. The government dragged its feet on the class actions for months and has spent years trying to defend the program, even though they were warned over 76 times over the years about their actions. So what I really don't understand is why the government had to get to the point of settlement instead of listening to victims' concerns. And I'll say it again, this must never be allowed to happen again. The government just settled on the cusp of the trial without admitting any liability, but obviously knowing they were wrong. And the Australian people really need and deserve to know who was responsible. We need to determine how it happened that ministers of the government either knew that the law was being broken and did nothing about it, or never bothered to find out that the law had been broken in the first place. And we need to discover how we got into the situation with senior public servants authorising a scheme which was illegal. Because if we don't do that, if we don't find out how this disaster occurred, how can we ensure that it won't happen again? So we will continue to push, Labor will continue to push for a Royal Commission into RoboDebt. It's the only appropriate outcome. And the government unjustly enriched itself with $720 million plus of people's money. And it did so at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars in administrative costs and legal fees before having to hand all the funds they raised back and pay compensation. This process, this policy, this program is incompetent at the highest level. And Australian taxpayers and robo-debt uh, robo victims deserve an explanation for this. One, Thank you, Senator Billick. Your time has death. expired. Thank you. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mac, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, uh, and just in regards to Senator Billick's comments, uh, it was certainly not the intention of the government to take money out of people's pockets. The government pays out about $180 billion every year in social welfare payments. We have a responsibility to the taxpayer to ensure that those, those dollars are spent properly and to ensure they get to the people who need them. Now, you know, it's only a small percentage, but not everyone, uh, you know, th there is a need for compliance in the system to make sure that payments are made properly. And it's a bit hypocritical for those op opposite us, the Labor Party, who are responsible for over a thousand deaths at sea uh, that cost billions and billions of dollars uh, to uh, overcome that problem to start uh, accusing us of uh, being malicious or anything like that when their own time in government, they were very, very inept at protecting uh, the lives of people. And indeed, many of the opposition front bench today, uh, who are on the front bench today, have actually come out and supported the idea of recovering over payments. And I will quote a couple of these people. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, tenure pleb sex, sorry, I'm not sure, is it member for Greenway? No, that's Sydney. Uh, she has come out and said, if people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. Uh, and we've also got uh, Senator, uh, uh, sorry, uh, member for Marybone, uh, Bill Shorten, the automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people being referred to, tax garnishee, to the tax garnishee process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of taxpayers. And finally, there was uh, Chris Bowen, who's the member for, do we know? Um, not sure. Senator Rennick, if yeah. you're not sure, just use Mr Chris Bowen? or okay. Ms. Sorry, my apologies. Um, as well. That's okay. Uh, it is important that the government explores different means of debt recovery to ensure that those who have received more money than they are entitled to repay their debt. Now, as uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Ms. Plibersek and Mr. Bowen said, the government does have a responsibility to recover debts where people have been overpaid. And 
uh, as Mr Shorten said, the automation of this process will free up resources. I also should say that, of course, the government recognises that the recovery of debt has to be done in a way that is lawful. And that is why the government has made uh, decisions uh, to make repayments. And, uh, and I should also note that on the 11th of June, the Prime Minister apologised in Parliament for any hurt and harm caused in the way the government has dealt with this issue. And um, uh, department officials uh, have also come out and echoed the set sentiments of the Prime Minister uh, at uh, recent inquiries. Um, there is no doubt errors were made in relation to the automation of the income compliance program, and these are being addressed, and we will make the repayments uh, to make sure that uh, just cause is served. However, you know, we, we shouldn't shy away from the importance of technology. As I said earlier, we pay over $180 billion uh, every year in social uh, welfare payments. Uh, there's over 1.2 million people uh, who receive income support. So, you know, if we want to, and, and you know, as the population grows, as payments get more complicated, uh, and I work in the tax side of things, and I must admit, I've always found that easier than actually trying to understand all the different uh, social service payments. So I could understand if you're trying to do it manually, uh, over time these things get more and more complex. So I think the fact that we are trying to automate the process uh, is something that should be applauded. And I ask you, would we go back uh, and turn off uh, internet banking, for example? Uh, I think we all enjoy the benefits of automation uh, in, re in, in return uh, uh, for uh, internet banking. Um, so, uh, you know, there's always, you know, un unfortunately we've made mistakes this time, but we are working um, to improve that. And, and one of those things I would, th would like to see, and I've mentioned this before on many occasions, is the need for parallel runs when we do implement new systems. And I've discussed this many a time with other departments about the need to make Thank sure you, you double-check things. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. This government's robo-debt scheme is a travesty and a tragedy. The government knew the damage this illegal scheme was doing to the people, and the Prime Minister was forced to an into an apology and now a last-minute pre-trial admission conceding it owes robo-debt victims their money back plus compensation. This is likely to total more than $1 billion the government owes victims of the robo-debt scheme. The settlement for approximately 400,000 class action members is both the most costly and involves the most people of any settlement by an Australian government. But it is some form of justice for victims who have been treated terribly by the Morrison government. And for years, the Morrison government has been in denial about robo-debt's fairness and legality, even after the defective robo-debt system has wreaked a trail of carnage across the nation, resulting in anxiety, poverty and even suicides. This dodgy scheme is more than what Christian Porter now calls legally insufficient. It has cost countless Australians their livelihoods, and, in some cases, their lives. It's only after the prospect of coalition ministers such as former Minister for Human Services, Alan Tudge, having to take the witness stand to answer questions on what they knew that the government has now agreed to fairly pay back victims. There are so many dirty hands involved in this dodgy scheme. Scott Morrison, then Social Services Minister and then Treasurer, was a key architect of RoboDebt. Christian Porter, who became Social Services Minister, was also involved in Mr Robert. This government, the Minister and this Prime Minister will not even answer the most basic questions about how this illegal RoboDebt scheme was designed and implemented. The Minister has dodged and ducked thrown up flimsy claims of public interest immunity time after time after time, and just plain refuse to answer questions about robo-debt. And the Prime Minister needs to step up and answer the questions about how robo-debt came into being and when the government was first made aware that what they were doing was actually illegal. He needs to answer the question about exactly how much this botched scheme cost the country. And he needs to make it very clear what they knew and when 
about the devastating impact the robo-debt scheme was having on individuals and the reports that were received about threats of self-harm. What is it about robo-debt's origins that the government does not want anyone to know? Were they told it was illegal and ignored the advice? Or did they not check its legality at all before unleashing it on an unsuspecting public? How much extra in taxpayers' money has the Morrison government wasted fighting this unwinnable case? Only a royal commission into robo-debt will give the public the answers they deserve. And only a royal commission will give the families of those who took their own lives after falling victim to robo-debt some answers. This government has not even bothered to find out how many people have threatened self-harm or how many victims of robo-debt have tragically taken their own lives. You cannot refund the debt. And the government must immediately allow such an independent inquiry into the robo debt scandal. Sunlight on how these hidden decisions were made is vital. It's needed to ensure the Australian public is never again exposed to whatever has gone horribly wrong here. It is extremely offensive to the Australian public that no one in this government is taking any responsibility for this $1.2 billion scam on the Australian people. Every day that no minister is stood down over this theft from the public is another argument for a robo-debt Royal Commission as the only route to accountability. And in the meantime, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, must explain what the consequences will be for ministers for their involvement in the single greatest social security scandal in this nation's history and the subsequent cover-up. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator O'Neill to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. Um, and I rise to take note of the response given to my question to the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Now, I asked about the climate emergency that we're in, given that we've just seen last night the hottest November, we've just had the two hottest November days, and we've had record breaking temperatures recorded across this country as a heat wave uh, is due to uh, move across this continent over the coming days. And I mentioned that the Bureau of Meteorology have advised us on the record in Senate estimates that, in fact, the targets that this government have set for 2030 would have Australia on track for a four-degree rise or upwards of temperatures. Now, I don't think perhaps people appreciate the extent of devastation that a four-degree rise would cause. The Paris Agreement commits us to a two degree and a, a spy to a one and a half degree, and yet this government's policies have us on track for more than double that. That's a recipe for not just economic destruction and an awful lot of human misery, but it's a recipe for mass crop failure. It's a recipe for the rest of the reef bleaching after half the coral cover has already died from mass bleaching events, of which we've now had three in the last five years. Um, it's a recipe that we should be avoiding at all costs. So I asked the minister, will the government be reconsidering its 2030 targets in the light of what the science says is necessary to keep us all safe and um, to, to retain a livable society uh, and natural world? And what I got with the talking points that uh, emissions data released today shows that Australia's uh, dropped its emissions by 16.6 per cent. Well, I asked the minister about that very point because, in fact, when you take out the land use emissions that Australia uses but no other country uses, our emissions are higher than they were in 2005. There is not, in fact, there has not been a reduction at all. So once again, we see this government using dodgy accounting tricks to disguise what is patently obvious to most Australians that this government has no climate plan. It is completely in bed with the coal, oil and gas sector. 
And we know the extent of donations that flows to the coffers of this government, sadly also to the opposition party. We're up to, I think, it's $9.2 million um, from the fossil fuel uh, sector. And look what that buys. It buys inaction on the climate crisis. And it buys that devastation that we could so readily avoid with a rapid transition to 100 per cent jobs-rich, affordable, clean energy. We could be manufacturing those components domestically, creating more jobs. We could be running that manufacturing on clean renewable energy. We could be exporting that renewable energy and that renewable energy technology to the world. This is a recipe for us addressing the climate crisis, creating jobs, helping to rebuild after a pandemic, uh, and helping to do our bit globally, because um, we see many of our trading partners are actually setting much stronger targets than we are, and in fact, they've, many of them have set dates to exit fossil fuels. But this government has got its head completely in the sand. We've got that climate summit coming up soon, um, just ahead of the Glasgow climate summit, where 2030 targets need to be spoken of. And this government has given no indication whatsoever that it will uh, listen to the science and increase its targets. We are likely to be amongst folk like Saudi Arabia and Russia when it comes to our climate ambition. Now, that's embarrassing. We already have the uh, highest per capita emissions profile in the world. We still have that dubious honour. Uh, and yet we have such potential to turn that around. And when I put that to the minister, I just got the talking points. I got this obsession with gas. Apparently gas is a transition fuel. Well, nobody believes that. It's not, in fact, the case. It is almost as dirty a fuel as coal. It wrecks farmland. It endangers groundwater. It often happens without First Nations consent. It is not a good way forward when we have reliable, clean, renewable alternatives that create more jobs and don't wreck, up, don't wreck the land. Obviously, the renewable sector doesn't donate enough to this government or the opposition to get more support, but it's pretty tragic that that's what's got to happen in order for science-based, evidence-based policies uh, to eventuate. So we live in hope of uh, the government lifting its climate targets ahead of 2030 so that we can actually address the climate emergency and come out of this economic and health pandemic stronger uh, and with a long-term future we can be proud of. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes.